So this downward sloping Phillips curve can present a real challenge to policymakers. What the Phillips curve says is that all else equal, for the Fed to bring down inflation, they have to decrease aggregate demand. They have to engage in some kind of contractionary policy that's going to shift aggregate demand to the left, causing higher unemployment and lower output. Quantifying this requires us to use the sacrifice ratio. Basically, we're trying to convert how much GDP we're going to lose to reduce inflation by one percentage point. A lot of estimates have put the sacrifice ratio fairly high, at about five. So basically, to reduce inflation by one percentage point, we would have to reduce real GDP by 5% in one year. And so, for example, let's say that inflation is above the Fed's target. Let's say inflation is 6% and the Fed wants it at 2%. That means to get inflation back down to 2%, we're going to have to sacrifice 20% of GDP. Or that difference between inflation and its target times the sacrifice ratio. And now we can bear this sacrifice ratio. We can bear it for one year and lose 20% of GDP, or we could spread it out over time, perhaps losing 5% of GDP over the next four years. But either way you slice it, the sacrifice ratio says that it is fairly costly for us to decrease inflation. And so that cost of disinflation, the cost of bringing inflation back down is lost GDP. We could translate that back to unemployment and the Phillips curve by using Oaken's law. And so, so far we've primarily assumed adaptive expectations. Most of these estimates for the sacrifice ratio assumed adaptive expectations. But adaptive expectations are perhaps somewhat of a stretch. If I asked you what the weather was going to be tomorrow, you wouldn't tell me what the weather was yesterday. You would probably look at your phone, open your weather app, and see what the forecast was. Doing that is using rational expectations. That's taking in all available information. And so if we assume that economic actors use rational expectations, we're going to say that they take in all information about current and future policies when they make their decisions. And that can have significant effects for the Phillips curve and for the sacrifice ratio. Specifically, it can mean that we might be able to bring inflation down without having to push unemployment up. We can do that by potentially allowing people to update their expectations. And so let's take that same example. Let's say that the unemployment rate is at its natural rate and inflation is at expected inflation of 6%. But the Fed says that they want to do some kind of contractionary policy to bring inflation down. And they'll do whatever it takes to get inflation to 2% from this 6% amount. If people believe the Fed, they're going to update their inflation expectations. They're going to change EPI from 6% to 2%. And so it's possible that the Fed could decrease inflation without having to increase unemployment at all. It's possible that the Fed could decrease inflation by just getting people to believe that they would decrease inflation. And so inflation would be able to fall without the unemployment rate rising at all. So if you recall, before spring break, we talked about how inflation in the U.S. in the 1970s was really high. And so Jimmy Carter appointed Paul Volcker to the Federal Reserve. And Paul Volcker came in and said that he was going to do whatever it took to get inflation under control. They were going to cut the growth rate of the money supply. Paul Volcker went on the cover of Time magazine and said that he would do whatever it took to get inflation under control. And so we can look at the data and see if Paul Volcker actually got people to change their expectations in response. So in 1982, the unemployment rate was quite high. It was nearly 10%. If we assume that the natural rate of unemployment was 6%, that leaves us with a cyclical unemployment rate of 3.7%. And by 1985, the inflation rate had gone down quite a bit, but we still had some amount of cyclical unemployment. We still had 1.2 percentage points of cyclical unemployment. Now we can take this data 
and see if Paul Volcker actually got people to revise their inflation expectations by calculating the sacrifice ratio. So we know that inflation went down by about 6.7% over this time, but the total sum of cyclical unemployment for these four years was 10%. We know from Oaken's law that 1% of unemployment is equal to about 2% of lost GDP. And so to, for un, cyclical unemployment to be 10% means that we sacrifice 20% of GDP. So to get this sacrifice ratio, all we have to do is divide that lost GDP by how much we brought inflation down. And we'll see in the case of the Volcker disinflation that the sacrifice ratio was actually 3.3. It was much lower than the five that had previously been estimated. And so it wasn't as costly for us in the US to bring inflation down. We only had to sacrifice 3.3 percentage points of GDP for every percentage point we brought down inflation. Basically, it looks like Paul Volcker was fairly effective at getting people to update their inflation expectations. By doing all those things, by saying he would do whatever it took in increasing transparency, we got people to update their expectations, and so the U.S. didn't have to suffer that full sacrifice ratio. And so, so far, we've assumed this natural rate hypothesis. We've assumed that the economy will always come back to the natural rate of unemployment, and that we always return to that long-run aggregate supply curve. So we always come back to UN, and we always come back to Y bar. This is an assumption that comes all the way from chapter three. But it's possible that these variables could change. It's possible that the natural rate of unemployment could go up and go down over time. It's possible that that long run aggregate supply curve could move based on different factors in the economy. So this idea that the natural rate of unemployment can move, we're gonna call that hysteresis. And it's that these shocks to all these other variables in the economy can have lasting impacts on these long run variables. Basically, if we have a negative shock to the unemployment rate and unemployment is high for a really long time, it's possible that that pulls the natural rate of unemployment up. Similarly, if GDP is below potential for a really long time, it's possible that that will decrease the long run aggregate supply curve. And the intuition behind this is fairly simple. Hypothetically, if we have a negative shock at the economy and a worker becomes cyclically unemployed, they lose their job just because the economy is not doing particularly well. Over time, their skills deteriorate. Basically, they're just not as good at their job because they haven't been working. So if they're unemployed for a really long time, their skills are progressively going to deteriorate. But because they lost their job, they're no longer on the inside. They're no longer negotiating for different wages. And so it's possible that they go from being an insider, an employed worker, to that outsider, where they're not allowed to negotiate for higher wages themselves. So when the recession ends, when the economy starts to get better and return to its natural rate, this person who was cyclically unemployed becomes structurally unemployed because their skills deteriorated and they were never able to get that job back. That raises the natural rate of unemployment because this person who lost their job because of a recession becomes structurally unemployed because they then became an outsider, because their skills slowly deteriorated over time. And that pushed the natural rate up and allows the natural rate to move over time. 